stand to your feet. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he tells them to be imitators of God. I was thinking last, last week, Jesus died, rose again, redeemed us, forgave us of our sins while we were sinners. Christ died for us. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, that we are now forgiven, redeemed, set free, inheritors of eternal life. Now what do we do with it? What do we do with it now? And Paul tells the Ephesians, imitate God. Like if you don't know what to do with this Holy Spirit in you, imitate God. Look at your neighbor and say, imitate God. Imitate God. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray, Lord, that transform our lives. Water us with your word this morning. Make us different. Make us more like you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I had no idea that was that many Elvis impersonators around. <laughs> Tell them, I, I'm telling you, you don't have any idea. Did a research, CNN said, back, did an a Elvis impersonator research back in 2011. Who does that? Elvis impersonator. You, you realize in 2011, there were 85,000 Elvis impersonators worldwide. 85,000 Elvis impersonators worldwide. Now, that is an astronomical number of Elvis impersonators, but what is more astronomic, astronomical about that is that the idea that there's Russian Elvis impersonators. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? My blue suede shoes. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, <laughs> I went, this is where we've gone with this, with Elvis, this is where we've gone. Do you realize in 1977, there was only 170 Elvis impersonators? You know it would be freaky if you had an impersonator and you're still alive. Like, no, 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 I can still do the show. You don't have to get the tribute band. I'm not dead yet. So from 1977 to 2011, you had from 177 to 85,000 worldwide. Now listen to this. This is mind-boggling. By, by the year 2040, which is 23 years away from now. So a lot of you will be alive to see this. It'll, be, it'll just be a great thing. 23 years, Elvis impersonators, if they keep growing at this rate, will make up a third of the world's population. <laughs> so like every third person you, you see could be an Elvis impersonator. You're at Walmart, you're like, I'm pretty sure he is. I'm pretty sure he's an Elvis impersonator. I had no idea. I, I, I actually like Elvis. Um, I'm a fan from way back. But um, imitation is something um, that really isn't that popular in our culture, right? We don't, we don't say it out loud that we want to imitate somebody. But Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he tells them emphatically that you need to imitate God. And then, and then in the Gospel of John, Jesus told the disciples, he said, he said, I only do what I see my father do. He said, I only say what I see my father say. Jesus was the example for us. He said, I'm imitating God. I only do what God does. And so then Paul comes along later and says, hey, like your job is to be an imitator of God. And so the issue is, is in our culture today, we value individuality more than imitation, don't we? We value originality more than imitation. And so we tell each other, we tell our kids, we tell each other, be the best you you can be, right? We tell them, be the best you you can be. And, and so we're striving as hard as we can to be unique and individualistic and be the best me I can be and I'm not going to be like anyone else and so I'm going to do something crazy to make sure I stand out from the crowd and, and all these things and I thought about you know we live in the selfie deal and and I'm you know I didn't grow up with the internet 
And so some of this stuff, we, like I was having a conversation with a friend at lunch the other day who's a little bit older than me. And we were having this conversation. I was like, dude, when I was growing up, I didn't want a camera around. I don't want nobody taking a picture of this to tell somebody else, like, this is between us. We don't need a record of it. Anybody else grow up like that? <laughs> See kids taking pictures. I'm like, put the camera away. I don't even know if what we're doing is legal. <laughs> and so now, now my, my mind doesn't go to automatically, like, this could be criminal. Like, you ready? I don't think about taking pictures of it. I think about afterwards. Oh, man, somebody took a, should have took a picture of that. I don't think about it. So, but here's how I know that we really are not trying to be original. Here's how I know it. It's because if you are really trying to be yourself, then you take a real picture of yourself. Because the older I get, the more this thing hangs down. Amen? Like this little, like, I don't know what it is. It's just like jiggly. It's like this little thing under here. And the older I get, the more this thing sticks out. And so if you take a selfie, you don't want anybody to think that you're you. Because if we're all honest, that is me. And the best me I can be is with this thing sticking out and with this thing hanging down. But that's not the picture I'm going to send you. The picture I'm going to send you is me holding my breath like this. And, and me holding the camera out and me holding my chin up. And then that wasn't suitable enough to us, so we made sticks to get the camera out further away from the real us. And we hold the camera out now five feet away, and we're like, the real unique me that looks like everyone else. Where'd you get the idea to do that? Because you saw someone else do it. You're like, oh, I know they got double chins, but you can't see it in the picture. Right? Girl, did you get stuff done? No, just pick your head up when you're taking the picture. <laughs> it's like, bro, it looks like you lost 20 pounds. You're like, I'm as fat as I've ever been. I just <gasps> sucked it up for 30 <laughs> seconds, right? Be the best you you can be. You know what? That's not good advice when you're the problem. You see, some of us run around blaming everybody else. But what I found out in my life is I'm the common denominator in all my problems. Because by definition, they're my problems. And I don't know about you, but I've, I've learned somewhat in life that the, if I really want to fix things, the first person I need to look at is me. Because if you blame everybody else, sooner or later, the only person to blame will be you. And so as much as we are pushing for everyone to be the best you you can be, the issue is the best you you can be is still a problem. It's sti you're still part of the problem because the best you you can be is still sinful, still envious, still greedy, still lustful, still, still, still hate people, still get angry. I don't know about you, but on my own, that's the best me I can be, right? And so I start, I start looking at this age. My kids are getting older, and, and uh, many of you know my oldest daughter is going to be moving out in August, and can't, my, my middle daughter can't wait to have the bedroom by herself. I'm going to let you know. She's like, free at last, free at last. Um, and and my, my oldest daughter is moving out, and she is, she's like going to, I don't know what she's going to do, burn all her stuff or something. But... Um, but, my, but what I'm noticing now is that my kids do things that I do, all right? But some of the things that they do, I didn't teach them how to do. Like, I got this little, weird little quirk. If I've ever been to your house and I did it, I'm sorry. It's not bodily noises or anything like that. But, but what I do is I line things up. I'll be sitting here preaching and there's two windows in the back door. And then there's a door outside that goes outside. And I'll line up the edge of the window with the edge of the door while I'm preaching. And you think I'm being really intent. <laughs> Perfect. 
And, and I, I don't know, I, I do it a lot, actually. I'll sit in my living room and I'll look out and I'll line up the edge of my window with the edge of my garage. I just like things to be in line. Well, my, as my son got a little bit he's the only one I've caught doing it, I think. The other ones don't have it, the problem. <laughs> I've, I've seen my son, he'll go like this. He'll be sitting somewhere, he'll go. And I'm like, first time he did, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, nothing. <laughs> like, you just closed one eye and you're intently staring at something. And I went, he's doing what I do. <laughs> this kid's gonna be great. <laughs> this kid is gonna be great. I didn't teach him how to do that. I also didn't have to teach my kids how to be angry. I didn't have to teach my oldest daughter how to punch her sister. That came real natural. <laughs> I didn't teach her how to punch her younger brother, but, um, but I did thank God the other day that the Holy Spirit is in her, at least a little bit, because he threw the basketball the other day and hit her dead square in the nose. And, um, and she said, I wanted to punch him so bad. Uh, but he started backing away. <laughs> and I thought, well, we'll call that the Holy Spirit. I don't know what else to do with that. She said, I was afraid I was going to get in trouble. I was like, Madeline, I wanted you to say God in me kept me from doing that. Not yet. <laughs> so I didn't have to teach them how to do that stuff. They just naturally knew how to do it. So the best my kids can be, the best them they can be oftentimes on their own is that type of thing. Reality the best me I can be is the struggles that I've struggled with my whole life. And the sins that you committed 10 years ago and you're still committing today, if you're left to your own devices and the best you you can be by yourself, you'll be committing them 10 years from now. But in society, we don't, we don't like imitators. We don't like people that, that, that look like they're copying someone else. We, we like everybody to be, oh, come on, do. You, we tell our kids, you can be anything you want to be. But the truth of the matter is they can't, right? You've been lying to your kids. You can be anything you want to be. You're four foot six. You will never play in the NBA. <laughs> I just go ahead and tell my kids that. No, it's a lie. You can't be anything you want to be. You're slower than your grandmother. <laughs> You are never going to be an Olympic athlete. Go to school. You can be anything you want to be. You're a great, you'll be the best you you can be. The problem is, that's the problem. And Paul tells the Ephesians, listen, now that you are children of God, now it's time to be imitators of him. Be an imitator of God. And so it's, it's, a, in, in, um, it, it's the best form of flattery, right? And I remember, I might have said this before, I remember going to Lowe's one day and I'd gotten this, I had, uh, went on a mission's trip, I left a tool belt I have. I love carpentry stuff. I had a tool belt that I'd had for probably 15 years. And um, I left it at that place. It smelled kind of bad, but I thought, you know, they could use it and I'll get another one. <laughs> so um, I left oh, my hammer, everything in it. So I get a Lowe's and I get this really nice tool bag. Man, it fits really nice. Got a new hammer, got new everything. So my son sees it. And the next time we go to Lowe's with his own money, he buys the same tool bag I have. And I just step back. I was like, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Dad, I'm going to get a tool bag like yours. Yeah, you should do that. I'm going to get a hammer just like the one you got. Yeah, yeah, you should do that. We had tape measure. And then, we, then we, when we go to work on something, he puts his tool bag on just like I do mine. He's imitating me. And I'm realizing that there's a lot of things that he imitates about me. Some of the things I taught him, but some of the things I didn't have to teach him. So watch this. Paul says, now that you're, now that you're children of God, we need to be imitators of him, Right? And we know that Jesus, while he was here, he said, I don't do anything that I, that I don't see the Father do. I do whatever he does. And I say whatever he says. 
So I, I'm an extension of God. And so when I look at my son, I, I, I love the fact so far that he's an extension of me. I think it's really neat. Except that he won't take his boots off when he comes in the house. I'm like, that may be a lot like me, but I paid for the floor. So watch this. There's things that I don't have to teach my kids that inherently get because of DNA. They just get wired a certain way because I'm their father and Beth is their mother. They're really, really smart because of Beth and they're kind of handy because of me. But we don't have to teach them those things. And Paul writes to the Corinthian church that when you become a new believer, when you believe on Christ, that old things have passed away, old things have passed away, and all things have become new. They're, they have been made new. I believe God has done a DNA swap with you when you become a believer. Because the Holy Spirit now resides in you. And so sin that you used to, that you used to not even struggle with, you, you used to just do it and not even think anything else about it, now all of a sudden there's a struggle there. And you're like, I, well, two weeks ago this didn't even bother me to do this. But now it does. What happened? What happened is now you're a new creation. you got a different dad now. You're a child of God. And so what happens is there's things that God doesn't even have to teach you that are wrong. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Because now you know that that thing you did two weeks ago, the spirit of God lives in you. You wake up after doing it now and you go, oh God, I shouldn't have did that. How do you know that? It's that old things have passed away and all things have become new. God placed his Holy Spirit in you and now you've got a different DNA. Now there's, now there's this thing called a conscience that you might not have had before, but now the Spirit of God is in you working as your conscience. And now all of a sudden, without even being taught, oh man, I'm gonna have to apologize for that. And your wife goes, what? It's been 30 years, you've never said, I know. And if you keep nagging me about that, I'll never do it again. No. Uh, so what's different? Nobody told me the spirit of God's just in me. And now there's something different about me. Because the spirit of God in you is pushing you to imitate God, right? Because God realizes set to your own devices, the best you you can be is still trouble. It's still without redemption. It's still going nowhere. It's still void of eternal life. It's still worse than anything you could do after accepting Christ. It's, it's death, what the Bible says. That the best you, you can be on your own is not good at all. And I know this isn't popular nowadays because, you know, everybody's good. The problem at the end of the day is, is me. But the answer is for me to be less like me and more like God, right? The, 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 the solution is to be less like Chris and more like God. See, when you go to an Elvis impersonator show, I just found out this morning in the first service that somebody was actually married by Elvis. Well, their vows were renewed by Elvis. They got a video of it. I don't know if that's legal either. But when you go to an Elvis impersonator, you don't want to see them. You came to see Elvis, right? You don't want to see a 70-year-old Elvis, right? You want to see an Elvis in his prime. And so when you get there, you're looking at the stage and you're waiting on this guy to come out in this sequence, bell bottoms and the belt and the rings, and you want him, you want him singing and gyrating and I mean, that was the trouble with Elvis, right? You don't want for a second to see that guy. You want to see Elvis. Because you wouldn't pay money to see that guy. Because without him imitating Elvis, he's got nothing else going on. 
Who'd you come here to see? I came here to see Bill. And every now and then he says, sound, says something sounds like Elvis. I just think he's a nice guy. No. What'd you come here? I came here because I think this guy sounds exactly like Elvis. See, the trouble is, is that the best we can possibly be is when we look the most like God. I'm not trying to actually be God and take his place. I'm trying to be a follower and imitator of God. Because I know that God's ways are higher than my ways. I know the way he thinks is not the way I think. And so the more I try to be like him, the less I have to worry about this flesh. Which Paul says, it's our job. He said it was his job. He has all these freedoms. He said, I could do whatever I want. And you know what? Thank God that you live in the United States and within certain reasonable standards, you can do whatever you want to do. Somebody say amen about that. Paul said, I can, I've got all these freedoms as a Christian. I can do whatever I want to do. But the reality is that God called me to imitate him. And so I make this body submit every day. I don't want to be a better Paul. I want to be more like God. And so I don't want to be, I don't want people to see me. I want them to see Christ in me, the hope of glory. Because if they just see me, there is no hope. I don't understand why things aren't getting better. What are you doing? Well, you're acting more like you. Well, I just tried to, just tried to be more intentional about it. What you, I'm more intentional about being angry? I'm more intentional about being greedy? Because Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, listen, this is what the flesh produces. If you want to be more like you, this is more what you're going to get. Listen to what he says here. Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 19, he said, here's the problem. The acts of the flesh are obvious. He said, it all comes natural to us. We all know it. It's obvious. It's like the nose on the front of your face. Everybody knows this is the way it works. He said, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. We're going to be the best us we can be, right? <laughs> Have you looked at society lately? In our culture, right here in this area, drugs are rampant. Do you think people wake up in the morning at 16 years old and think the best me I can be is a strung out on heroin? No. But that's where the best me I can be takes me. We got people all over the world walking into packed places and shooting people. They didn't wake up saying, I'm going to be the most terrible person I can possibly be. The history of my life will be that I was terrible. Now, everybody wants to be great. Everybody wants to be unique. Everybody wants to be the best me I can be. But the trouble is, that's where the flesh takes us. Paul's telling the Galatians, he said, listen, this is what the best you can produce. It's going to produce stuff that at the end of the day you don't like. So I didn't have to teach my kids how to do certain things. It just came natural. But then through the years, I look at them and I say, hey, listen, you got to tell the truth every time or I'll slap them. You, you, you have to stick it out when things are tough because God says that, that suffering produces things. And you can't quit a team because your soccer coach is terrible. You gotta learn how to persevere. You gotta learn how to be a positive influence with God working through you in every situation. You've gotta, you've gotta rise to the top of your class because, because the Holy Spirit is in you and you can do more that nothing is impossible now. The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Come on, it'll quicken this mortal body. It'll, it'll, it'll give you the power to put down the flesh. So when everybody else in class is lying, you can't. When everybody else is being disrespectful, you can't. Those are the things that I had to teach. 
And I felt like over the years, like Paul, where he looked back at Timothy, the young kid, and he said, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. He, said, he wasn't saying, Im Im imitate me. He was like, watch the way I imitate Christ, and you do the same thing. You see, it's, it's, not, it's not you go out and tell people about me because I'm the pastor. It's you go out and tell people about Jesus because we're all imitating him. So Paul says, listen, the best you can do with just you, the best you can do with you alone is not good. It's the problem. So the answer is to be less like me and more like God every time. Less like me, more like God. Less like me, more like God. Here's what happens then. Paul continues in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit... Remember, we accepted Christ as our Savior, and now the Holy Spirit indwells us. It lives in us, and it's teaching us stuff. Our DNA has changed. The old has passed away. All has become new. And so he's given us a new life, a fresh start, a new beginning. And now our call to action is to imitate God. So now what happens? Now the fruit from imitating God is this. Love, joy, peace. Somebody say, oh my God, those are the things I need, right? Love, joy, peace. He says, these are the things that don't come naturally. These are the things that when you imitate God, these are the things when the Holy Spirit is in you and you're imitating God, these are the things that are produced in your life. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he says, against these things, there is no law. If you're acting like God, you don't need a cop. You don't need, if you're acting like God, you don't need anybody to say, sit up from the table and, and act like you got some manners. If you're acting like God, you don't need anybody to tell you, hey, you're getting angry right now. If we're imitating God, we're people that live self-controlled lives. Because the spirit lives in us. And Paul said, now I can make this body submit. He tells Timothy, he said, listen, Timothy, God did not give you that spirit of fear. That was what you got naturally. That was who you were. The best you could be was a scared kid. The best you could be was insecure by yourself. The best you could be was fearful. The best you could be was less than what God wanted you to be. But with God, he says, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but as you imitate God, he gives you a spirit of power. Come on, some of us need power in this place. Love and a sound mind. He said he gave you the ability that when, that when, the, that when the rubber hits the road, that when, that when all hell breaks loose, watch this played out in the life of Jesus. Watch this played out. Now, you remember back in, Je in the book of John, Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I see the Father say. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying. And the Bible says that he is so stressed in his physical body. He's so stressed out in this flesh that it said he was sweating like drops of blood. And he prays this prayer. He says, Father, if there's any way let this cup pass. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. There's no part of this fleshly body that wants to do this. None. I'm so stressed out right now, I can't even think. I got, I got three disciples back here laying under a tree snoring like it's Christmas evening. Like, like, like I don't even know what to do. Like, I'm so, like, I don't want to do this. And in a split second, he acts like the God he is. And he says, but not my will, yours be done. And the tenacious, persistent God revealed himself in Jesus. And so the most beautiful thing that happens in our lives is when the Spirit of God enters us and then we have the opportunity not to act like us, but to act like Him. We get to act like Him. 
We don't supplant his power. We don't take his spot. But we say, listen, there's God. This is what he's saying. This is what he's doing. I'm going to act like daddy today. Right? You know what the thing that scares me? When my kid acts like me sometimes. I'm like, don't say that. Especially around your mother. (laughs) Don't do that. I remember one time we were in the, in the barn working on my daughter's car. My son was in there. I'm trying to show him we're pulling an axle out, put a new axle in. And, and something happened, and we witnessed some people being really angry. And I gave him this dad speech. I said, Carter, listen, anger gets you nowhere, man. I'm serious. I'm not just making this up. I had the conversation. Listen, anger gets you nowhere. You got to control your anger. The Bible says you need to be self-controlled. Holy Spirit in you gives you that power. You need to be self-controlled. Anger doesn't get you anywhere. I'm laying under the car. I've told that boy a hundred times that I'm under the car, don't touch anything. <laughs> There's about this much space between me and the car. It's as high as the jack stands will go up. About this much space. I've got a, a, a shop light pulled down from the ceiling over here. You know, one of the kinds on retractable wires. It's on this side of my face. There's not enough room for the shop light to go between my face and the bottom of the car. My son pulls on the wire. And you know what happened? <laughs> Hits me upside the face, and I come out of that. What? <laughs> Carter, remember how I told you about not being angry? <laughs> you better run home right now. No. <laughs> no, I just said, buddy, I told you not to pull in the rope. Please, please. <laughs> Don't pull the rope anymore, man. (laughs) Act like God, not like me. Because what I just told him about was the way I would have responded. But I can't afford to act like me anymore. I can't afford to act like me anymore. I can't afford to do me. I can't afford to be the best me anymore. My kids can't afford me to be the best. My wife can't afford me to be the best me anymore. This church can't afford me to be the best me anymore. It needs me to be more like God. Your wife, kids, grandkids, neighbors, employees, associates, they need you to be more like God, not more like you. Because more like God is where blessing is going to come into their lives. Now watch this. Stand to your feet. The band's going to come. Watch this really quick here. This is awesome. Ephesians chapter five, verse 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Why should we do that? Because that's what God does. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. If it's the Lord's will and we're doing his will, we're acting more like him, right? What did Jesus say? Not my will, but yours be done. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to, which leads to debauchery. Look at your neighbor and say, you know it does. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Because being filled with the Spirit helps us to act more like God. Now watch, here's the part where the church comes together. Can you read it up there? Go to the next verse. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. All of you just went, I don't know if I want to do that. Paul's saying, when you meet each other, sing. I'm so glad to see you today. You're great. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil. Just turned into Mr. Rogers, isn't it? Watch this. Here's what he's saying. When the Spirit of God is in you and you're acting like God, you'll be an encouragement to each other. This is just the way it played out back then. It's going to be weird if you come in singing to me. But I'm going to tell you something. Watch this. If you come into me this week and you start, man, my life, Chris would say, that's because you made it that way. You don't want more of me. Because I'm like, dude, you, got, you get what you get. 
But what the Spirit of God in me does is allow, when I want to say something stupid, I instead, like Paul said, make this flesh, this body, this brain submit, and I, and then I imitate God, and I say, He is your hope. He is the one you can trust in. He's the lifter of your head. He can redeem you. He can set you free. He can work this thing for good to those of them that love him according to, according to his purpose. He, he could do above and beyond all you could ever ask or imagine. I can then say those things because that's what God would tell you. So when we come together, it's not like, well, they're getting what they get. That's what they deserve. No, we're encouraging each other saying, yes, we're falling in sin, but we're redeemed people. Above all people, we have hope. Jesus is alive and he's resurrected and we have something to look forward to. We have eternal life. Pick your head up. He'll redeem you. He'll save you. He'll set you free. He'll deliver you. Come on. That's our song. So here we are. Who are you going to be? Are you going to be more like you or more like him? More like you? And more like him, we wake up with the decision every day and Paul said, I will make it submit to the will of God. So here's what I pray. I pray when people walk in these doors, I pray when people see us at Walmart, I pray when they see us out, they don't see Chris. They say, man, there's so much God in him that I don't even recognize him anymore. There's so much God in him, he's not the same God I knew 10 years ago. There's so much God in him, he's not the same person I remember back then. Old things have passed away and all things have become. It's like I'm looking at a God impersonator. It's not, it's not God, but he's trying to be just like him. He, he, he says things that God would say. He repeats things that God did say. And, and you know what that brings? It brings hope, it brings peace, it brings joy, it brings patience, and for, it brings all those things along and the world needs that they don't need more of me they need more of him amen father we pray this morning that from this step forward we would draw a line in the sand and say less of us and more of you that the that the crux of our lives improving and and this gospel going forward is more of you more of you more of you lord and less of us and we give your holy spirit permission to kill the us in us lord kill the chris in chris and put christ in me put the holy spirit in me to quicken this mortal body and i pray that in that in next week when we show up, we don't recognize each other. We just see God at work and in, involved in our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Come on, give him honor and glory.